That's for social scientists that want to do more data science, data scientists that want to do more social science, and now I've also added... When I've been working on this project, uh, a lot of my colleagues ask me, it's an interesting idea to work on a book like that, but isn't computational social science just a fad? Uh, so let me address this very simply by saying no. It is not a fad. And the reason why I am so confident about that is because what is happening in computational social science is not being driven by stuff that's happening within academia it's being driven by changes in the world. And these changes in the world are happening and will continue to happen. And as people interested in doing social research, we have the option of either taking advantage of these changes in the world or being left behind. Um, so one way to think about these changes, this is a graph that supposedly shows the amount of information in the world. This is from the Hilbert and Lopez paper from 2011. And Roughly speaking, so here's 1986, here's 2007. This bar here is the amount of data that's stored in analog, and this is the amount that's stored in digital. So this leads to two sort of qualitative findings uh, or patterns. One is that the amount of information in the world is increasing, and it's increasingly digital. And so, but when you think about this digital information, you shouldn't just think online. That's many people's first reaction. Oh, computational social science is about Twitter and Facebook and online behavior. But increasingly, we're going to have fully instrumented physical world as well. Uh, and so this really, you should think about this as being not just online, but everywhere, especially digital devices in the physical world. Um, so. It is true, though, that there are definitely some fad-like elements in what's happening. Uh, and so, for example, many universities are starting computational social science institutes or big data centers. And it seems like all that can't be happening so quickly just based on some fundamentals. So this is a graph that's called the hype cycle. And I think it's a very helpful way to understand what's happening now when people talk about big data and computational social science. So the x-axis here is time, the y-axis is visibility, and initially something changes in the world, and then everyone gets really, really excited. So this is like big data is going to cure cancer and end poverty and make everyone happy. And eventually people realize that's probably not going to do all those things. So then people move down into this trough of despair where they're like, oh, big data is stupid. And then eventually they're like, actually, you know, it's not so stupid. There's some things it's actually pretty good for. And then you move into this plateau of productivity where this just becomes a normal thing. So I think we are going through this cycle now with big data and with computational social science. Um, so I think my goal of the book is to push down this peak of inflated expectations, to pull up this trough, and then to help us get to this plateau of productivity as quickly as possible. Um, in terms of, I do want to say a bit about what this plateau of productivity will look like from my perspective as a social scientist. So to me, what this will mean when it is that 
the stuff that we now call computational social science will eventually just be called social science, and it will become a normal thing that people use when they study any social phenomena like education or religion or race and ethnicity, all the things that we study already, we're just, this is just another way that we can study those things. So I don't think the changing technology changes our goals as researchers. It just changes our, our, our methods that we can use to achieve those goals. So I think a, a, an example is like an x-ray machine and a doctor. The x-ray machine doesn't change what the doctor is trying to do, it just helps the doc, doctor help patients better. Also, the x-ray machine does not displace other methods. So you, a doctor would never say, well, I have an x-ray machine. I would never need to talk to a patient, right? Because that would be a silly thing to say. Uh, and likewise, with computational social science, it doesn't displace all the other ways we have of doing social science. It's just another way to do what we were trying to do before. Um, I should also say, if you have any questions, we can make this a, more of a conversational style. I'm happy to take any questions as we go. Okay, so at a high level, um, what are some of the main ideas that come out of thinking about this for a while for how social scientists and data scientists, what they have to learn from each other? So this is the part of the talk where I insult social scientists and I insult data scientists. Uh, but I'm doing it in a very, in a spirit of respect and admiration really to help the, each of these communities see really what it is that how the other community sees some of what they're doing and how they could learn from this other style. Just can I get a show of hands? How many people here think of themselves as social scientists? Cool. How many think of themselves as data scientists? I saw some people raise both. And how many people here think of themselves as a computer scientist? Okay, so a lot of you computer scientists do not want to be called data scientists. I understand, it's okay. Um, okay. So this urinal, I think, is a beautiful metaphor for data science. Um, so as you all know, this is a uh, fountain by Duchamp. So in 1917, Duchamp was walking around New York. He saw this urinal in a hardware store. He was very taken by it. He bought it, wrote uh, a pseudonym on it, and then submitted it to an art show. And this is an example of what artists call a ready-made. It's something that already exists, and then an artist takes that and repurposes it into art. And so I think a lot of what happens in data science is very creative repurposing. There's big data sources that are generated for commercial or governmental purposes, and then data scientists say, actually, that data can be repurposed for research. So when it's done well, this is incredibly innovative and creative and can fundamentally change what you think your field is about. So people thought I put this up maybe as a little bit of a joke about data science, but in the same way that the fountain changed the way artists think about what art could be, I think that a lot of the clever repurposing that we're seeing now will change eventually what social scientists think social research can be. Um, so this repurposing style, though, it eventually runs into limits, right? So, and, and you know, there's not always a beautiful ready-made available. And this style really sits very funny to social scientists who use a different style, which you could think of as illustrated by this, uh, David. So Michelangelo didn't walk around looking for something that looked kind of like David. Michelangelo said, no, I want to make David, and I'm going to spend three years working in this marble to produce the thing that I want. And so you have these ready-mades and custom-mades. And social scientists, the way that we go about working with data is heavily driven by custom-mades. We have ideas, then we try to go and collect data to test those ideas, rather than looking for data that we can repurpose uh, to address some question. And so these, I think, are two styles, and I think each community can learn a little bit from the other. I think social scientists, it will become increasingly difficult to only work with custom maids, given that the volume of ready maids is going to increase, and that's going to get richer and richer. And I think likewise, data scientists are going to see that by collecting your own data, you can do stuff that you could never do just by working with ready maids. And then in increasingly what we'll see is a hybrid between these two. And I'll give you a specific example at the end of the talk, 
which I think is a beautiful hybrid that shows there are things that you could do by combining these two strategies that you could never do with each strategy individually. The second is about um, style, let's say. Uh, so, and you may think style is not an important thing, but I think it's actually a big barrier to a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration. And I think it is beautifully illustrated by this glass. The social scientists in this room may see this glass as half empty, and the data scientists may see this glass as half full. Uh, I've noticed there's a very big difference culturally in how people approach their researchers. Social scientists are very much focused on the problems with any particular piece of research and how it can be made better. And data scientists are much more focused on what is cool about this particular thing. And so I think both of these communities could benefit from sort of looking at the other half of the glass a little bit more. Um, social scientists saying, even if this is not perfect, this is pretty cool. And data scientists, even if this is pretty cool, this is not perfect. Um, and I think one of the most important ideas that data scientists have in their outlook that social scientists don't have as much is a sort of an orientation towards the future. So I think social scientists are very focused on how well does this particular method work right now. And if you go by that criteria, then a lot of the research, computational social science research, doesn't look that good. But if you look at the trajectory and you think, what is, how is this going to work five years from now or 10 years from now, then I think it starts to look very different. And this is a much different question than we normally think of as researchers. Usually, we evaluate the specific paper sitting in front of us, and we don't think as much about the trends. But if you, so I've been working in this computational social science space for about 10 years now, and there have been really big improvements really big improvements. I think these improvements will continue. And so if you focus not on the level, but on the rate of change, then I think it starts to become clear why this is an important thing for social researchers to learn more about and work more in this area. OK. <clears throat> so if we're thinking about the future, uh, and while I was writing this book, I wanted to write a book that would make sense in yeah, ideally 20 years. but at least five years, right? I have books in my office about things like how to use MySpace to do social network analysis, right? And so I did not want to write a book like that. Um, not that it was not a good idea at the time, but like the key is that the technology is changing very quickly. And so anything that's focused on specific things that exist today is not going to make sense probably in the future. Um, and so I think the right way to write a timeless book on a timely topic is to have the right kind of abstraction. And so I think that abstraction is research design. So this is a concept that social scientists are very familiar with. In fact, m many of us uh, in most PhD programs in sociology, for example, this is a required course, one of the few required courses. Um, it's, I think, a concept that's less familiar to uh, data scientists, but it's roughly how you think think about how you organize what your research is doing. So let me give you some examples. Uh, so I think there are basically four main research designs. The first is observing people's behavior. So this is what most big data now is. We have data on people's behavior. But to many social scientists, this is the weakest design. Because you, as a researcher, have no control over how the data is collected. You're not intervening in these systems in any way. So when you look at big data, some people think, oh, it's a lot of data. But another way to look at it is, oh, this is a really weak research design. So moving down, the next level of sort of interaction with is asking people questions. So you intervene in the system in a way to ask people questions. Then researchers could run experiments. So here you have a much stronger kind of intervention where you create some treatment and you randomize people to the treatment. And then finally, you can create a mass collaboration. So here, I'm thinking of things like Wikipedia, citizen science, and so on. So this requires more control by the researcher over the environment. And so I think right now, we are so focused on big data. We are focused on just this weakest design. And I think the future of this field is going to be towards these more active designs. So moving towards more data collection. This is something we've seen in the social sciences. So in sociology, like one of the first pieces of empirical sociology 
was suicide by Durkheim. And, you know, he used suicide records. That was the big data of his day. And it was a great book, but we didn't stop by and continue. We, we, like, we didn't just use suicide records and other automatically created data. We said, no, eventually we need to start collecting our own data. And I think that's going to be something that happens more and more in computational social science. Yeah? Sure. Yeah, it's the least typical. So these three designs are things that many social scientists are familiar with. Many social scientists do not really consider this a research design. Uh, so here, I guess the sort of guiding question is, what kinds of problems can we solve together that we couldn't solve individually? And so this can include things like uh, human computation kind of problems. This can include things like open contests, like the Netflix prize. And this can include distributed data collection projects, like eBird. And I, I would encourage you to read that chapter. That, I'm not going to talk about them for the rest of the talk, but that chapter is up there. And I think this is really the most exciting part of, um, and, and sort of the most speculative part of the book, because it's something that many people don't see right now as a part of social research. And many of the examples that I have in the book are not from social science. But I think increasingly social scientists will take advantage of these um, approaches because, again, there is stuff that we can do together that none of us could do individually. And, and mass collaboration, sometimes this is pitched as a way of saving money, right? Oh, we're not going to do all the work ourselves. We'll just have volunteers do the work. And I think that there is a higher version of this also, which is not about saving money, but it's about doing better research and different kinds of research. OK, so beyond big data. So with this talk, I want to try to move us towards beyond big data. And I'm going to talk specifically about asking questions. So the first step down this path of having a more active role in how the data is collected. And I want to talk a little bit about how asking questions uh, and survey research is going to change because of the digital age. So when I talk about this, the, one of the first questions I get is, well, why should I care about surveys? And it's true that most people don't like surveys. Most people don't like being in surveys. It's not a good user experience. Uh, most survey researchers don't like writing surveys or working with survey data. But um, surveys are a fundamental measurement technique in the social sciences. That is how most of what we know quantitatively about the world comes through surveys. So, if we want to continue to learn about the world, there will be a place for surveys in the future for reasons that I will explain in a second. So why should, if you care about quantitative social research, then I think you have to care about surveys. Uh, and I agree that surveys as they are now are not perfect. And I think there's an exciting thing is that there's lots of room to improve them. Then <clears throat> the second question would be, why should I care about surveys in the age of big data? You might say, well, maybe we had to do surveys before. But now everything is going to be recorded, and so we don't need to ask people questions anymore. I think this is wrong for three reasons. So first, <clears throat> there are a lot of limitations of big data. Um, one way to sort of summarize them, I think, is this little acronym. Uh, acronym. So when I was in high school, there was this clothing company called FUBU, which stood for For Us, By Us. And I think a lot of this uh, big data that's collected by companies and governments is new food, new boo. So it's not for us, and it's not by us. So as a social scientist, they don't collect the things that I want. They don't store the data in ways that I want. And they're not going to do that because they're, they don't have my interests at heart. They have to do what they have to do to provide the product that they're providing. So one example would be my uh, cell phone company can say, what percentage of phone calls go between people whose credit card number ends in 9? That is not a particularly interesting question to me. I would like to know what percentage of calls go between people of different ethnicities, or different levels of education, or different incomes. And these are things that the phone company is not going to collect. Some of them, they actively, I think, do not ever want to collect. Some of them, they just don't care. Whereas credit card numbers, they care about a lot. And it's not something that I care about. So I think there's a lot of ways that the interests of 
researchers and the interests of companies are not perfectly aligned. Also, um, a lot of this data uh, that's behavioral data gives us information about what people do, but not necessarily what they think. So social scientists distinguish between external states, which is like behavior, and internal states, which is things like attitudes, uh, knowledge, expectations for the future. All of these things are important in explaining lots of social behavior and are also sometimes things that we try to explain. And the best way to get at those internal states is to ask people. Uh, finally, even if a lot of this data exists, it's not accessible. So I think my favorite example of this is the Utah Data Center, which the NSA has out wherever it is. And supposedly, that has every email and every web search that people do and every phone call. I have no idea what's there. But that would be an amazing source of data for social researchers. But we are never going to get access to that. So for our purposes, uh, at least as researchers, that data does not exist. Um, and I think a lot of the data has that kind of characteristic that even if it is stored somewhere, it will not be accessible to researchers because of the privacy concerns and the business concerns. So given these limitations of big data, I think we're always going to have to do surveys. Um, but how we do those surveys is going to change. So now I'm going to do a very, very brief history of survey research um, to illustrate uh, a couple points about what's happening now. Because I think what's happened in the past is, in this case, very um, has some good lessons for what's going to happen in the future. So surveys, as we would recognize them, began in the 1930s. <clears throat> and sampling was done through area probability sampling. So they would pick, let's say, certain uh, census blocks using probability methods. And then people would travel to those places and do the interviews face to face. So someone would knock on your door and say, I have some questions for you, Nick. And then you would have your interview there. Now, in the, let's say, 60s and 70s, in uh, wealthy countries, researchers said, hey, lots of people have landline telephones. Let's do surveys over the telephone. And so we had this sampling method where rather than sampling areas, we would sample telephone numbers. And then interviews would take place over the telephone. Now, I very quickly, um, I've made it sound like this transition was totally smooth. And that is, in fact, not what happened. So there are huge debates when this was happening. People said, oh, you can't do surveys over the telephone. That's crazy. Like, not everyone has a telephone. People will answer differently. There's all kinds of problems. It was very heated debate about this transition. But eventually, researchers solved those problems because they realized that there were real benefits of being able to do surveys in these new ways. And so they said, you know what? We're going to solve these problems. So they didn't let the problems prevent them from working on this. They the problems encourage them to work on it. Um, the other thing about this transition that is interesting is that a lot of stuff was happening before it was all formalized and beautiful. <clears throat> so the main paper that sort of formalizes in a theoretical way the random digit dialing technique that is commonly used, the waxberg matowski algorithm. So this was published in 1978 in JAZA, in the Journal of the American Statistical Association. It's a really nice paper. But people had been doing random digit dialing for a long time before that. So this pattern of seeing the people are kind of hacking things together and trying things, and then eventually things become formalized. But I think people who are now saying, oh, there's no theoretical basis for certain things, need to realize that there was not a theoretical basis when this started either. The theoretical basis often comes after years of trial and error. So now I want to talk about this third era. So we're, I think, transitioning into this third era now. And I think this third era will be um, in the same way that these two have sort of um, approaches that are associated with them. I think the third era will be associated with uh, non-probability samples, computer-administered interviews. And a different dimension is also surveys more linked with other data. So right now, a lot of surveys are standalone. You do your survey, you analyze the survey data. But as the data environment gets richer and richer, it becomes more and more attractive to try to link your survey to some other form of data. So I think these are sort of the three areas 
that will characterize this third era of survey research. A lot of these things are already starting to happen, and I want to just briefly walk through each of these. So non-probability samples. This is, um, so this is the way I was taught, and I think many social scientists were taught. So probability samples are samples where there is a no non-zero probability of inclusion for each person. So you can think of there's a, the, the simplest form is there's a list of people. The researcher gives each of these people a probability of inclusion and then uses a randomization device to pick these people. If you do something like that, you can prove very nice results. And this is from the Horvitz-Thompson 1952 paper, which sort of formalized uh, probability sampling. So this is beautiful. Uh, and non-probability samples lead you to big, embarrassing things like incorrectly predicting the outcome of the presidential election. So this is the way many people are trained, and this is not the right way to think about the world now. So I think the right way to think about the world now is the following. Probability samples, there is an unknown sampling process, and then there, there's a bunch of weighting based on unverifiable assumptions to deal with this unknown sampling process. So, this is what, when you have non-response in your surveys, so let's imagine I have this beautiful list, I give a bunch of probabilities of selection, I have my computer randomly pick people, and then I ask them to be in the survey, and they say, no, I don't want to be in your survey. So then the people that we have are no longer, um, it's no longer the design that we created. And so to deal with that problem, researchers use a bunch of adjustment techniques, and these adjustment techniques depend on assumptions, which is fine, but this is, this is the world. There's, there are unverifiable assumptions in how we work with this data now. Uh, with non-probability samples, there is an unknown sampling process and there are unverifiable assumptions. So this, you may, now this is a, very, this is a, it may seem like I'm belaboring this point a little bit because this is something that is very sensitive to a lot of social scientists. They think that what I'm saying here is a little extreme. And I think a reasonable thing to say is, I like these assumptions better than I like these assumptions. I think that's a fair thing to say. But now we're in an empirical world where we have to actually compare these things. And so I want to show you an example of a non-probability sampling technique that can produce uh, reasonable results, does not always lead to Dewey defeats Truman. Um, so this is a study by Wei Wang and colleagues uh, forecasting election with non-representative polls, they had a bunch of data that they collected an uh, opt-in survey on Xbox. So basically, people who are using Xbox, there would be an ad there that would say, do you want to do a political survey? They would ask them a bunch of questions about the upcoming election. This was for 2012. So if you know anything about Xbox, you might suspect that the people who respond to this are not directly representative of the US population, and you would be right. So for example, they were largely male, and they were much younger than the electorate. And so a social scientist's first reaction is, oh, this is going to screw up the estimates. You can't possibly learn anything. These people are, are non-representative. But I want to highlight something that they had 750,000 interviews with about 350,000 unique respondents. Now, normally when people talk about the size of a data set, it's, part of it is just like showing off. It's like, hey, I've got this many millions or billions of tweets or whatever. But in this case, it's actually really important scientifically because, OK, so now I'm going to get a little bit into the weeds of this post-stratification adjustment technique. Um, basically, what, when you reweight this data, what you're doing is you're going to split your sample into a bunch of demographic groups, like women between the ages of 18 and 49. And what you're assuming is that th people in this little group that you've created all, all are behaving similarly, roughly. So what you would like is you would like these groups to be as small as possible, not just women between 18 and 49, but women between 18 and 49 in New Jersey who have a college degree, for example. Then the assumption is more reasonable as these groups get smaller and smaller. As, these, as you get more and more of these groups, though, the amount of data that you need also increases. So in this case, because they have 350,000 respondents, they can make lots and lots of these little groups. So the assumption that they need for this technique to work well is more reasonable than what they would need if they only had 1,000 respondents. So when you think about Dewey defeats Truman, there were not 350,000 unique respondents there. The other thing that they do here is they do something called 
multi-level regression post-stratification, which is another technique which did not exist in 1948, and I don't need to go into all the details. But so the point here is, it, this, if it didn't work in 1948, that does not mean it won't work in 2012, which I think everyone can support that idea. Uh, so how did it work? Um, so here is the x-axis is the time. The y-axis is the estimated two-party support for Obama. So this is the unweighted Xbox data. This is if you just like average who's in your sample. And you see that this moves around wildly. as, And so this might lead you to believe that, oh, we can't learn anything from non-probability samples. But in fact, this is what happens if you weight the data. So if you do this post-stratification technique, and you see it's actually quite close to the final result. And in fact, even closer to the final result than the aggregate of a bunch of telephone surveys as collected by pollster.com. So in this particular case, given appropriate reweighting techniques, non-probability samples can do quite well. Now, this, this is not a proof. There's no, we do not know that this will happen like this the next election or the election after that. But I think this helps to say, the difference between probability samples and non-probability samples is not as big as people believe now. And there's a lot of opportunity for non-probability samples as the sample sizes get larger and as our adjustment techniques get more sophisticated, this becomes an increasingly attractive alternative because the costs are significantly lower. OK, so that's non-probability samples. I want to talk briefly about computer-administered interviews. Um, so right now, a lot of survey interviews are administered by humans, either face-to-face -face or over the telephone. And increasingly, that is expensive. Um, and I think we'll see move, more of a move towards computer-administered interviews. Now, this, you may think I'm talking about like robocalls. Uh, that is not what I'm talking about. That is, that is a computer-administered interview. But that is an example of not really taking advantage of what computers can do, I think. Um, so moving from human-administered interviews to computer-administered interviews enables certain changes that I think I will illustrate an example of what it enables, and it also requires certain changes. So we have to make a better user experience for people in these surveys so that they will actually want to do them. So social scientists are used to working in an environment where the people are relatively captive. You have like undergraduate students in your psychology lab. They, they can leave if they want, but generally there's like social norms that encourage them to stay. And it's the same with when you're talking to someone on the phone. Uh, now, if you're moved to a fully online setting, there's nothing that is really keeping your respondent there in the same way. And they're just one click away from the skateboarding dog. And so how would you design a data collection for someone who's one click away from the skateboarding dog? I think it's not just take what we've done before and put it online. It's try to do something a little different. So this project I'm going to tell you about now was joint work with uh, Karen Levy, who was a graduate student here at Princeton, uh, is now a professor at Cornell. And it was inspired by this website, kittenwar.com. So if you go to kittenwar.com, you will see two kittens. You will also not hear anything else I say during this talk. Um, you can click on whichever kitten you think is cuter, and then and, uh, and again, and again, and again. And before you know it, you spend 20 minutes clicking on kittens. But there is something actually more interesting and deep happening here. So if you click to see the winningest kittens, this is what you get. And yeah, it's pretty cute, right? Uh, and if you click to see the losingest kittens, this is what you get. Yeah. OK, so, whoop, so this very real social signal, this very, re this very enjoyable um, response mechanism is able to detect this very real social signal. And the other thing that I think is particularly fascinating about Kitten War is that all of these kittens were uploaded by users. So user-generated content is not an exciting thing in the data science world. But in the social science world, it's actually very strange. So usually, if we were going to write a survey, we would sit and think and write the questions and write the answers. And we, we wouldn't really <coughs> think about, imagine having our users play a role in shaping how the data is collected. Um, but there's a problem with this. When we write all the questions and we write all the answers, we're really limited in how we can learn about new things. 
And so Kid and War, I think, really kind of solves a fundamental tension that exists in how social scientists collect their data. So on the one hand, we have methods like surveys that are really good for, at quantifying large amounts of information, but they're closed to new information generally. So you've written all the questions, you've written all the answers. It makes it hard to learn new things from a survey. So this problem with surveys is well known. And that's why we have methods like interviews and focus groups and participant observation that are open to new information, but they're generally slow and expensive and hard to quantify. And so what we wanted to do with this project is create a hybrid called a wiki survey that would combine the quantifiability of surveys with the openness of interviews. So just like Wikipedia evolves over time based on user input, imagine if you had a survey that evolved over time based on user input. And this would allow you to combine quantification with openness. <coughs> so, <coughs> so we, we said, OK, let's try to think about what are the general properties that we think this wiki survey should satisfy. So we didn't, because we said like a lot of the surveys we see online now, these are just basically face-to-face -face surveys put online. It's like you have a radio soap opera, then you put a TV camera in front of it, and then you say, oh, I have a TV soap opera. But no, you have a radio soap opera put on TV. And I think a lot of what we have now is we have face-to-face -face surveys put online. So if you were going to make a truly online, like web digital native survey, what, what characteristics would it have? And so we looked at a bunch of online information aggregation systems like Wikipedia, we tried to see what kind of properties those had and how we could sort of combine those kinds of properties with the kinds of properties that survey researchers think about. And so we came up with three general properties that we think this wiki survey should satisfy. So first, we think they should be greedy. So by that, I mean they should collect as little or as much information as each person is willing to provide. So uh, this is a cartoon graph of the amount of information contributed to Wikipedia per person. So here, these are the people on the x-axis. This is the person that contributes the most. The y-axis is how much they contribute. So there are some people who contribute lots and lots of information to Wikipedia. And then there are a lot of people who contribute a little. So this is sometimes called the fat head and the long tail. This is the long tail here. And lots and lots of online data has this shape. Um, now, this differs fundamentally from how social scientists collect their data. So we generally create, collect a fixed amount of information from each person. So if someone comes to you and says, I love your survey, I want to do it 10 times, first we would laugh because surveys are such a terrible user experience and no one would want to do that. But then we say, no, no, you can't do that. That's going to mess up our data. Likewise, if someone comes and says, oh, uh, your survey is OK, I'll give you two minutes. You say, no, no, can't do that. That creates item non-response, not allowed. Um, so we're leaving out all this information in the fat head and all the information in the long tail. And just to put a number on it, <coughs> if Wikipedia were allowed, to, were allowed 10 and only 10 edits, they would lose about 95% of their edits. So a huge amount of information in the fat head and the long tail. Um, now you may say, well, if you're going to collect all this information, isn't that going to screw up your analysis? And I would say it's going to have to change the analysis. And we're going to deal with this unequal amounts of information from each person and how we do the analysis. But the goal is we're going to try to make the best data collection experience for the user, and then we'll deal with the complexity on the back end rather than pushing the complexity onto the user. So that's greedy. Collect as much or as little as people are willing to give. Collaborative. So by this, I mean respondents should have a role in shaping the instrument, not just the researcher. And finally, adaptive. So if we treated our respondents' time as a valuable commodity, we would want to only ask them the most important and informative question next. And generally, surveys, the order of the survey is fixed the entire time. So, but by the time you've done 500 interviews, you actually know much more than you knew when you started. But surveys are not generally adaptive to take advantage of what you learn as you go. Um, so just to clarify, so collaborative is about being open to new information, and adaptive is about using the information that you have efficiently. So then we uh, wanted to 
make a system that satisfied these three properties. There is no system like this now, or there wasn't when we started. Uh, and so with a grant from Google and also from CITP, um, we created this website, allourideas.org. So it's a free and open source website. Anyone in the world can come here and create their own wiki survey, which we host for free. So this allows us to provide this very nice service to the world. And it also provides us a steady stream of data that we can use for future research. So just to give a very brief example of how it works, this is a project we did with Mayor Bloomberg's office in New York. Um, they wanted to uh, improve the city's sustainability plan. So which do you think is a better idea for creating a greener and greater New York? And they got to seed the wiki survey with a bunch of ideas that they had from previous outreach efforts. Um, they dumped that all into our website, and we created the wiki survey for them. So it would be like allourideas.org slash planyc. This is what a visitor to that website would see. They would see two choices. They could vote on which they prefer. And then a new pair comes up, and they can vote again and again and again. Uh, also, at any time, they can add their own idea, which goes into the queue to be voted on by others. So you can see that this is basically just kit and war for ideas. Now, in the interest of time, so then also you can see a score, which goes from 0 to 100, the, which is the estimated probability a randomly chosen user will choose this idea over a randomly chosen other idea from the pool. And then in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over how we actually do these estimates, but this is all in the paper. So this is the data structure, and then we make some modeling assumptions, and there's a posterior distribution, and we sample from that posterior distribution, and we estimate some scores, and it's all in the paper. Um, so you can see our paper for more about what happened in this particular case, the full details of the statistical model, and more about how system building can be a part of social science. So this is a big difference I've seen in the data science and social science community. Data scientists are often interested in doing something, like I want to improve X or build a system that does X. And social scientists are usually wanting to understand things. And often these seem to be different, but I think a lot of times doing and building and understanding are all related. And um, we could do all of, we could achieve all these goals at the same time. Uh, I will want to highlight, in this particular case, I will say that eight of the top 10 ideas were uploaded by users. And this is a pattern we see over and over and over again, that ideas uploaded by users are better than the best initial ideas. And in the paper, we have a sort of heuristic argument for why this will almost always be the case. And so that, to me, illustrates the value of being open. Right? If you're, if you're open and nothing interesting comes in, it's probably not so valuable. But we've seen over and over that it's valuable. So we're hosting currently about 8,000 wiki surveys with about 13 million votes in total. It's been used by governmental organizations, NGOs, and companies. OK, so that's computer administered interviews. So it's not just robocalling. Right? It, like, we can think a little bit differently about how we could collect our data in a different way. Finally, I want to talk about linking um, surveys to other sources of data. This is a paper uh, that just came out in Science last year, which I really, really like, and I think is a, a really good way to end the talk also. So the problem that this, there's rough, the problem that this paper addresses is poverty in the developing world, and basically figuring out how much poverty there is and where it is. So this may seem like a very basic question. Like in the US, we might be able to just go to the Census Bureau website and pull up a beautiful map of very well-collected and well-documented data. This is not true in most of the developing world. So very basic questions about how much poverty is there, how is this changing over time, and where is this poverty? Um, now, there's sort of two very broad categories for how we can collect this kind of governmental statistics. So one is censuses. So census, you interview <clears throat> every single person. And so censuses are really good for uh, what are called small area estimates. So getting estimates for, because it's very large, you have enough people in any particular region or any particular demographic group to get estimates for small groups of people. Um, the problem with censuses is they're very expensive, and they're also quite infrequent, so every 10 years, let's say. So we also have sample surveys where we interview, let's say, 1,000 people. 
And those are generally much cheaper. And they're also generally more flexible. So censuses, usually the questions are fixed long in advance. And censuses usually have to be short because they co cover the entire country. So with surveys, we can add more questions. We can do them at higher intervals because they're less expensive. But surveys generally don't have enough information to produce small area estimates. So it's hard to get like state by in the US. If a, you have a sample of 1,000 people for a public opinion poll, it would be hard for you to know how the estimates in Rhode Island are different from the estimates in New Jersey, let's say, or how the estimates for uh, college-educated men are different than PhD-level women, or anything like that. So now, what if you could potentially provide, create something that combines all the best features of censuses with all the best features of surveys? So what if you could potentially ask every single person in the country any question you want every day? Like, what if there was like a ubiquitous always-on survey? So this would be really, really cool for a social scientist. This would be really, really cool for policymakers. And this paper is a step, a, a baby step in that direction. So let me explain how it works. So uh, he starts with the call records from uh, the largest mobile phone provider in Rwanda. So for about 1.5 million people, you have all their calls uh, over the course of several years. But this call record does not directly contain the information he cares about, which is uh, information about household wealth. So he has to collect that information. So basically, he randomly samples a bunch of people from these records and calls them and asks them questions about their uh, wealth. And there are standard questions that are used in these kinds of surveys, and he used all of these standard questions. So now he has the call records, and he has this survey, and then he's going to link them together. So here's how that works. So first, there's this feature engineering step. Um, this is a sort of a data science -y term for creating a, a matrix where each row is a person, and each column, a social scientist would call it a variable, a data scientist would call it a feature. So this could be things like, um, <clears throat> how many outgoing calls did you have? or what's your ratio of incoming to outcoming calls, and so on. So the way he did this feature engineering is actually more sophisticated than just human coded things. So some of you may know about a bunch of techniques now in machine learning where you essentially try to automatically learn what the right features are. What he did is something in between human coding and automatically learning them, which you could read about in the paper, but it's kind of interesting. Um, so then what he did is he built a model that used these uh, features to predict what people said in a survey. So you could say, for example, people who tend to have lots of outgoing calls, maybe they're wealthier. So you can basically do something very simple like a regression model, where you have these variables and you predict this survey answer. Actually, what he did is more complicated than a linear regression. It's like a, like a lasso kind of thing as well. So this is. This step is very informed by machine learning. This step is also very informed by machine learning. Then once you have this model, that, uh, that you can use it to essentially predict what everyone else would have said in the survey. So a social scientists would call this imputing, or essentially just making up the data. Um, so now, though, you've approximately, approximately being a key word here, you approximately asked your survey to 1.5 million people just by asking 1,000 people. Then the final step in this is he also estimated where everyone lived. And you could do this from the call records because they have the tower uh, where the call was from. And so roughly the way they estimated the location is the towers where you call from at night. Mostly. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's basically the idea. So now you have basically what everyone says and estimated what they say, and you have their estimated location. So now you can produce small, you can produce geographically uh, estimates of poverty for small geographic areas. So how does this work? How well does it work? So this is how well, so there's one question here, which is how well from these features from the phone data can you estimate the survey responses? And so here's the actual wealth of the respondent that was collected from the survey. And here's the predicted wealth. This is like a cross-validation kind of thing. So 
it's not perfect, but it's not terrible. Then the question is, how well does this work out of sample? That is, once we do all this, once we do this imputa imputation for everyone, how well does this work? And so here we can compare to the demographic and health surveys, which is like the gold standard data collection in developing countries. They happen roughly every five years. And so we can aggregate these estimates to the regional level and then compare to the regional level estimates from the demographic and health survey. And here's the results. So this is the uh, average wealth from the demographic and health survey. This is roughly the, the you know, considered the gold standard measure. And then this is the measure that's imputed from the call record. So again, not perfect, but actually quite good. Um, and there's an important thing about this, that this is 10 times faster and 50 times cheaper. So 50 times cheaper here is not an end. Like we're not saying we should just sit, cut the budget of the demographic and health surveys. Uh, what we're saying is, what this means is rather than doing a survey every five years, you could do a survey every month. Like in the US, we don't measure the unemployment every five years, we measure the unemployment every month because that's an important indicator. And there's lots of other important indicators that if we could do surveys substantially cheaper, we could do them at much higher frequency. Also, if you've ever tried to get a question onto the demographic and health survey in Rwanda, which I have, I can tell you it is impossible. It's not impossible. It's very difficult, very difficult, because everyone wants to get their questions on the demographic and health survey. So imagine if there was something like this starting every month, then lots more people could put questions on it, and it would like open up a lot of different possibilities. Um, and there's nothing specific about this recipe to cell phones and Rwanda and wealth, right? This could be any big data source. This could be any survey question. This same recipe can apply. Um, so what I love about this is it's this beautiful combination of the ready-mades and the custom-mades. So without the call records, the thousand survey respondents would not have given you these small area estimates. And without the survey data, the call rec like each of these benefits the other. Uh, just the survey data wouldn't have done it, and just the call records wouldn't have done it. So that's about linking data, and then that leads to a very important point, which we have to talk about, which is ethics. Um, this is an important, important problem in computational social science and something we as a community have to address. Let's say you really like this study and you want to improve this. Let's say you really care about helping measure poverty in the developing world, you can't do this because you can't get access to the cell phone data. And you probably shouldn't, that, that should not be widely available. Uh, so ethics is an important problem we have to address. In the book, I have a whole chapter about it, but I think there's one idea that's the most important idea, uh, and it comes from Spider-Man. And so in the end of the very first Spider-Man comic, he's walking away after his Uncle Ben was killed, and he says, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. So social scientists and data scientists have increasing power over other people's lives. We can observe the behavior of millions of people without their awareness or consent. We can put them into experiments, again, without their awareness or consent. This power can be used for really good things, uh, and it, the power must also come with an increasing sense of responsibility. So that's a little bit about the book. And I want to say the book is also completely available online now. As it was going through the peer review process, I also posted the entire manuscript online for an open review. So you can see basically everyone can annotate the text and help make it better. Then I'll take all the feedback that comes from the open review and all the feedback that comes from the peer review and produce the final book. Also, I just got a grant from the Sloan Foundation, and we're now open sourcing all the code that was used for the Open Review website. So we are releasing the Open Review Toolkit. This will be out in a matter of weeks. Uh, you can, there's some code up there now on GitHub. And basically, what this will do is it will pull together. We don't actually, like, what we do mainly to build these Open Review websites is we take a bunch of great projects that are open source or free, and we kind of stitch them all together. And so we spend a lot of time on this plumbing, and we don't want anyone else to have to spend their time on this plumbing. You can spend your time working on your book, because I know that takes a lot of time. And the plumbing is basically in the code now. So 
other people won't have to deal with that. Um, and so these uh, open review websites come with an annotation system. They come with a reader analytics system. So basically, we're tracking how everyone is interacting with the book. I can see which parts people read, which parts people don't read, which par parts stop cause people to stop reading, all that stuff. Framework for experimentation, so you can run A-B tests on top of your book. Uh, internationalization, so the book is machine translated into 100 languages. You can do the same thing with your book. Um, it works on different devices, and it's friendly with like search engines and social media and so on. So the end goal is that the open review of these books should lead to better books, higher sales, and increased access to knowledge. Um, and so you can go and participate now at bitbybitbook.com. So thank you.